it seems like it's gone quickly. It's our last night of the gospel meeting with Isaac Hall. He's done a great job. Uh, we have been blessed to be here with him this week and to hear the lessons he's presented on the future of the church. And looking forward to that last lesson this evening. Uh, we would like to remind everybody to pray for the missionary work we support. We had a great report from Steve Haley last Wednesday. Uh, and ask that you pray for the other mission works we support as well. Uh, just a couple of upcoming events. Uh, the security team has an outing uh, this Saturday. Uh, Dick Woodard has all the details on that. The youth are going to be uh, having a work day at the barn a week from Saturday. That's the 15th. Alan would have all the details on that. If you collect cans for Potter Children's Home, those are due the 16th. Uh, deacons, your budgets are due on the 16th. And uh, Grant County is now meeting for Bible class at 4 on Sunday afternoons and for worship at 5. That's a change in their schedule that uh, was effective in October. Uh, on the sick and prayer list, just to reiterate a few from Sunday, uh, Sandy Sparks was home after having a fall. Uh, her daughter has had surgery on the 27th. Alan's brother, Michael, uh, had been in a car accident, was in the hospital. He's home now, right? He's okay. Doing fine. That's good, good. Good to hear that. Uh, we want to pray for Dwayne Link, Dan and Carol's son. Uh, continues to struggle with his health. Uh, Amy Collins' mother, Glenda Brewer, was in the hospital. Uh, Don Owens and his mother and Kelly Woodrum's sister, Christy, uh, all are in need of prayers. Um, Bill and Bonnie Whitley, I believe they have been out because it uh, sounds like they may have COVID. So let's remember Bill and Bonnie in our prayers. Uh, and then also on Sunday, we announced the Bastion family, uh, Brian and E. Dana and their four young boys are all now have placed their membership here at Point Pleasant. So very excited about that. Uh, let's, I don't think that's all that I had. Anybody else have anything announcement wise? Yes, sir. So if you didn't hear that, uh, we'd like to pray for Russell Klein. Uh, he lost his wife, Tracy, uh, this past week. And uh, Tracy's a very good friend of Jennifer. Uh, so she's driving home tonight. And as we keep her in our prayers, also obviously for the loss that she suffered with her friend passing. Cody, do you have something? Okay. All right. Sorry to hear that. Anyone else? All right, let's begin with a word of prayer. Almighty God, thank you so much for such a beautiful day. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us with this day and uh, for blessing us with the opportunity to be here this evening. Lord, we are grateful for Isaac and the preparation that he has gone through and the fine lessons that we've gotten to hear this week. And pray, Lord, that we would take things that we've heard this week and remember those and consider those and uh, allow those to perhaps change the way we think or the way we live uh, and do all we can, Lord, to uh, promote and uh, do our best so that the future of the church is bright and so that your church would continue to be strong in this area, that our congregation would be strong and unified and, and blessed. Lord, we thank you for all the many ways you do bless us each day. We're grateful, Lord, for our health. We want to lift up those who uh, have been struggling with their health. Uh, we and also, Lord, those who have lost loved ones, we ask tonight that you be with uh, Russell Klein and the loss of his wife, be with Jennifer and the loss of her friend, and also as she travels back from the funeral. Uh, Lord, we all want to lift up the Whitleys. Uh, is their home not feeling well? Sandy Sparks and her daughter as she has surgery coming soon. Also, Amy Collins' mother and Kelly Woodrum's sister. Lord, please bless all of those who are struggling with health. Please bless the doctors and nurses who are attending to them and supporting them. And Lord, we pray that you would just be with all of us, help us to be the kind of Christians that we want to be, that we need to be, uh, that this world needs to see. And we pray that your church would grow because of our attitudes and our actions. And Lord, help us in that each day. Lord, uh, we ask that you be with Isaac tonight, that he recall everything he's prepared for this lesson, and that we would be blessed through uh, listening closely. And Lord, we also want to thank you for all the teachers who 
work so hard to teach our young people. Uh, please bless them as they teach their classes tonight. Lord, all these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jared will lead us in a song. Uh, then the uh, smaller folks who are, uh, will be having class tonight, you'll be dismissed to your classes. Uh, and then Isaac will present the lesson uh, after that. Jared. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you, singing Alleluia, Alleluia. Seek ye first. Good to be back here with you this evening. I think that's on. Okay. I've always had trouble with these for some reason. And every time I wear them, they usually fall off. This one's done pretty well, the microphone that is. But I always feel like Garth Brooks, which is kind of strange. <laughs> but just thought I should let you know that before we get started. It's good to be here with you on the last night of this gospel meeting, which of course also is a Wednesday night, and so that's a little bit different than the other nights, but I do want to say thank you for allowing us to come up here and to spend time with all of you, to get to know you a little bit better, or just to catch up with old friends, and we thank you for that opportunity, and of course, Elias thanks you for that as well, because he's enjoyed running around everywhere, and probably maybe being in your way, but also being very cute, so you got to enjoy that. This evening, we are continuing on with the same theme, of course, which is the future of the church. 
But with tonight, it's going to be a little bit different than what we've done the other nights. And so we've done some, some studies in the Old Testament and taken those and applied them to ourselves. But this is based more around a question. And it's not necessarily a question that we have asked, but rather a question that gets asked of us. And the way that this will tie in as far as the future of the church is concerned, it can tie in at least two ways. One, eternally speaking, this question does have great importance. But the second thing is that it, it requires us to adapt ourselves to be able to teach a world of people that may not look at us the way that we understand ourselves to be. And so we have to be prepared to give an answer for them and to them. And the question at hand for tonight and the question that you may or may not have heard before is, do you think you all are the only ones going to heaven? Now, I, I guess I'll make it into a poll. How many of you have ever been asked that question before? That's pretty telling. Why is it that that question gets asked of us? Well, hopefully it's from a misconception. But what we want to do is we want to take this question and break it down a little bit. And we want to see... Well, how should we, when we're asked this question, or maybe the statement is made in a somewhat accusatory way even, how do we respond to that? And how should we, how should we try to teach somebody whenever they bring this, this topic up? And so this will be a bit of an exercise in logic. Sometimes Christians have a tendency to shy away from logic. That seems kind of strange when you look into the Gospels and you see Jesus dealing with his opponents and you see that when he outwits the Pharisees at every turn, he does so based in logic. And so sometimes that's going to be necessary, and that tonight will be one of those times. Especially since we're dealing with a question, kind of like with Jesus, that in some cases at least is meant to entrap more than anything else. Now other times it's meant sincerely, or it's just what somebody's been taught, but certainly that can be a component of it. The other thing I'll say up front is that we are not intending in this lesson to teach that the churches of Christ have the, the sole secret to salvation. That's not the intent. But at the same time, we certainly better believe that that is true. Otherwise, why would we be here tonight? And why would we be part of this church? So one other thing I'll say as a sort of caveat is that with this lesson, this is an outline, sort of a question and answer, and yet it is a lot harder in real life to have this conversation because people are unpredictable and because they won't always follow a perfectly planned outline. But at the same time, we can use this hopefully and apply this in situations where this is asked. And so let's go ahead and get in to this question that we're going to talk about. And we want to make sure that when we do answer this question, whatever their motivation is in asking it, that we give an accurate and a careful answer to them. And so to start with, if somebody asks the question, do you think you're the only ones going to heaven? There are different ways to answer it, but let me suggest that maybe the best way is kind of a long way. And that's how we'll approach it first. And this would take some patience, both on your part and on the part of whoever it is that's, that's asking the question. But maybe the first thing that we could say would be a question in response. And this isn't an attempt at a Socratic method here. Really, it's just a, a practicality of a way to take the conversation in a direction to help them understand the position that we're coming from. And so the first question that you might ask in response is, do you think that you are going to heaven? Now, why do we need to do that? Well, they've asked, are you the only ones? Do you believe you're the only ones? Well, let's go ahead and start and, and clear the air a little bit here by asking, well, that's a great question. Do you think that you are among that group? And if the answer to that is no, that's a little bit different. If they say, no, I, I don't think I'm going to heaven, then they're probably either asking the question for some other reason, some strange reason that you might not need to respond to, or it's an opportunity to evangelize and say, okay, well, why don't you think that's the case? And, and what can we do to try to amend that? And so that may be the place to start there. But if the answer is yes, then we have to, to go a step beyond this. So if they believe that they are going to heaven, great. That's a, that's a good thing to believe. But the next question is, do you think that everyone is going to heaven? If you think that you are, okay. Do you think everyone else is? 
And so yet again, people could answer yes or they could answer no or something completely off the rails here. But if they answer to the question, do you think everyone is going to heaven? If they answer yes, then we probably need to get a little bit more specific. And there are some people that will fully believe this no matter what you tell them. And they believe that every person on this planet that has ever existed will be in heaven because God's grace will cover anything that was done. Well, you probably won't get that far with somebody that has that belief and holds it strongly. And that's unfortunate, but at some point in certain conversations, you, you shake the dust from your feet and you do move on. But if instead they, they do answer yes, but you can be a little bit more specific and you can ask, okay, well... In the text of Scripture, are we told that every person will be saved? Well, we're really not. And one basic example, and you know this first, but in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says of himself that he is the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. Well, let's get more specific. What does that mean if someone is Hindu, for example, and doesn't believe in Jesus as the Christ at all? Is it possible for that to be an avenue for them to get to heaven if they don't believe in him? No, that's not really going to be possible. And so you could use that example, and we're going to extremes here, but you could use the example of atheism and say, well, if somebody doesn't believe Jesus at all, then how could it be possible for him to be their way into heaven? And so the point of this question, and this is not an attempt at trickery, and we're not trying to back anyone into a corner, but what we do want to prove to people is Everybody draws a circle somewhere. And so maybe your circle is so inclusive that it has everybody on earth, but maybe it doesn't. And where do you draw the line? And who do you exclude from that circle? And so the, the point of this little exercise is to try to get people to recognize a simple truth about Christianity, which is that Christianity is, by its very nature, exclusive. And so if it is exclusive, then what we're trying to agree on is that not everybody will get into heaven. And if not everybody will get into heaven, then who will it be that does not? And so Christianity is exclusive. Again, if your questioner cannot agree to this point, you probably won't get much farther in the conversation. But hopefully you can continue on. And so if if you can, if you can talk to somebody long enough without them being too frustrated, or maybe without yourself being too frustrated. And you can prove the point that Christianity, by its nature, excludes some people. Well, then where do you go from there? Well, if you've already gotten this far in the conversation, you might as well bring a a specific passage of Scripture into this. And we could turn a lot of places. But tonight, let's try to turn to Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to take a look here and continue our conversation through this chapter in Matthew, Matthew chapter 7. So we've already asked the question in response to the initial question. Are you the only ones going to heaven? And we've, we've asked the question, well, that's a good question, but do you believe that you're going to heaven? Okay, if so, is there anybody that's not going? And now we get to the next part of this where you'd have to say, if, if not everybody will be saved, then why not? And why is a big question here. It's the, the question of the standard, the basis that you're using to include and to exclude. It's the basis or the standard of judgment. And where does that come from? Well, that's what we have to get into now. Hopefully, if you ask somebody this question, if you say, if not everybody's going to go to heaven, then why won't they go? Hopefully, their answer is spiritual in nature. And so hopefully, they'll say something along the lines of those who go to church. Okay, that's a standard. Those who have faith, that's a standard. Those who believe in Jesus, that's a standard. All those things could work. But to be more specific... And probably what you would need to work toward is to to point out that it's not just Jesus that saves, it's not just faith that saves, but it's a little bit more particular in that it's the whole text of God's Word that has the authority on judgment. 
And so even Christ himself in John chapter 12, verse 48, says as much. He says that my words will judge you in the last day. So we can say Jesus, but when we say that Jesus is the standard by which we are saved or lost, it's true. But if you're just thinking of the image of Jesus, it's a lot easier to twist that and to bend that and manipulate that to say, well, Jesus was so loving when he was on earth that he wouldn't punish anybody. But if instead we're able to say that the Bible itself is the basis, that that's the standard, that's a lot harder to twist. It's still possible, and people twist it to their own destruction, but it's at least more difficult. And so we have something firm, we have something that's more of a binding contract that we can work with. In Matthew chapter 7, conveniently enough, in verses 1 and 2, you're going to get one of the probably most popular responses any time that you make the suggestion that Christianity might be exclusive. The first thing that most people would think to say is, well, who are you to judge me? And so when we look at the text of Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, it says not, don't judge me, as people often misquote it, but judge not that you be not judged. And then verse 2 goes on to explain exactly what that phrase means. It says, For with the judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. There's a, a bit of irony in the use of this phrase to say that you shouldn't judge somebody based on the text of Matthew 7. When in reality, the text of Matthew 7 says, don't judge unless you're willing to be held accountable to the same standard that you're using. Well, here's the question. Am I willing to be judged by the standard of God's Word? In reality, would that matter? God's Word will judge me. God's Word will judge everybody. And so if we're taking verse 2 here and we're trying to say, well, if I'm going to judge, if I'm going to use this as my measure, if I'm happy to be judged by the Word of God, then that's the exact same thing I can use to judge someone else. Nothing else, not my opinion, not just the things that I think are right or wrong, but based on God's Word. It has the authority, and we can use that authority to judge somebody, not in the hopes of condemning them, but in the hopes of convicting them and bringing them into the right relationship with God. And so we fully expect to be judged by God's Word. Now, the other side of judgment here is that Christ, in the rest of this text, is going to talk about the way that we will be judged based on the choices that we make. And so there are, in chapter 7 here, there are three sections of choices. The first one's in verses 13 and 14, where Jesus says that there are two gates that you can choose. Either you can choose the narrow, or you can choose the broad. And one of those leads to life. The other one does not. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 does not say, don't judge, because if it did, it would contradict Jesus just a few verses later in saying that you will be judged based on this choice. There's another choice as well in verses 15 and following. There's a choice between two teachers. And so either you can choose the false teacher that comes in among you, or you can choose to follow the teacher that is Christ. That's a choice, obviously with different results again. And there's a third choice that is presented starting verse 24. And the choice there is of what foundation you're going to build upon. And again, there are consequences to the choice. As for building on the solid foundation or the rock that is Christ, things will go well for you. If you build on that foundation, we expect that eventually, if you stay on that foundation, you would end up being among those who will be going to heaven. Great. On the other hand, if you build your house on the unstable foundation of sand, then what will be the eventual result? Well, without getting too technical, and I hate to use big theological concepts when preaching, but here it is. If you build your house on the sand, it will inevitably go splat, right? And so you can make your choice, but the choice comes with a judgment. And so the judgment component of this is not from us, it's not from our opinion, but it comes from the Word of God. And so this is the Bible standard that we will be using. But all of this really just goes to show that the Bible has the authority to judge. 
And so if, if we're using the Bible as the authority to judge somebody, not ourselves, and if we're trying to answer the question, who will be the only ones going to heaven, then at least we can answer, okay, I can tell you the answer to that, but I can't personally tell you, but I can show you what God's word says. That's always a good position to be in when you're talking to somebody that has questions about the Bible itself. Not, what does Isaac have to say about that? Because that doesn't matter too much. But what can I show you from God's Word? And so we can go a little bit farther with this, though. Because so far, what we've really said is that there are two choices. Either Christ or not Christ. That's simple enough. And so is it the Bible's standard of judgment that if you choose Christ, you will be going to heaven? Well, not so fast. And again, that's why we're in the text of Matthew chapter 7, because right in the middle of all these choices, we find the the verses that we're probably familiar with in verse 21 and following. Matthew 7 and verse 21. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Beyond just the choice of choosing Christ, evidently there's a little bit more that goes into it. Because it's not enough to say, Lord, Lord, It's not enough to just have belief, to just have faith. On the other hand, it's not enough to say, Lord, haven't I done enough good works in your name? Haven't I been a good enough person that you're going to accept me? And Christ says, no, no, that's not how that works. Instead, there's one basis that's shown here in verse 21. It's not those who say, Lord, Lord. Instead, it is he who does the will of my Father in heaven. That's simple enough, and I think that it really is that simple, but the principle by which we will be judged is our obedience to God. The point's reiterated in verse 24. It says, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, that's the person that will be likened to a wise man who builds his house on the foundation of Christ. And so, again, simply enough, Obedience is the answer to the question of how we will be judged based on the Bible standards. Maybe it's an oversimplification, but if you want one principle by which judgment will happen, it's going to be this, with a very healthy dose of God's grace making up for what we are not able to obey. And so if we bring out this principle, that sounds good, and I think it is good, but then if we're still having this conversation with someone that's asked this question, do you think you're the only ones going to heaven? And all I've told them so far is, well, according to the Bible, those who are obedient will go to heaven. Then what do you think their response is going to be, except to say, well, great. Isn't that most Christians? Isn't that most people? Aren't most people obedient to God? Don't they try to do His will most of the time? And there's some some fairness to that. But on the other hand, Is that always the case, that that people who are trying to be obedient are actually being obedient to God? Well, if we look around the, the world of Christianity at large, then we see literally thousands, actually tens of thousands, of different denominations of Christianity. And how many of them do the same thing? I'm not aware of any two that do exactly the same, or they wouldn't be divided. And so if it is that there are these tens of thousands of different churches that are doing different things and teaching things that are opposed to each other, can they all be right, and can they all be obeying God? Well, unfortunately, no. Can it be that someone teaches in one church that salvation happens when someone believes in God? And another church teaches that salvation happens only after someone has been immersed for the remission of their sins. Those two things cannot be true at the same time. And so the obedience has to be found with one and and not the other. The same thing could be said of how often communion is taken or any number of examples. In reality, even though we would like to accept as many people as possible, and we would hope that God's grace and wish that God's grace would cover everyone, 
we still read the words of Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. And we come back to this and we say that you enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Verse 14, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few who find it. The word in the original language for few, also you can tell just by the English with the contrasting of many and few, it implies a minority, which means that even of those who seek out the way, there aren't a whole lot of them that actually find it. There's a minority of people that find it. And so we would expect that not everyone will be saved. Why? Because of what we've already said, that Christianity by nature is exclusive. And it must exclude those who do not obey. It's not that God does not save because he's not powerful enough. It's not that God does not save because he's not loving enough. But God does not save because people will not obey his will. Based on his justice, he will not accept them in. He will say, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And so who are the only ones going to heaven? Well, it would only be those who obey the Bible standard of obedience to God. And again, that sounds simple enough. But what we've done so far is look at this from a, I guess, a theological perspective. And we've looked at the underlying principles here. And I will say that we have to do that at some point. Because too often, the tendency for us and the, the problems that arise for us are because we deal with surface-level issues. And that's true in every area of the world, by the way, but it's true in Christianity as well. And so we'll have an argument with somebody about, let's say, abortion. And we'll, we'll ask them, well, how are you okay with killing children? Do they believe they're killing children? No, they believe that that's not a life yet. And until we understand that perspective, not that it's right, but until we get down to that level and say, actually, no, that is a life. And instead, we just say, you like to kill children. How, how well is that conversation going to go? The same thing happens more directly within the church on instrumental music. And we'll argue the, the merits of that versus the, the negatives and the lack of examples in Scripture. But really, all of that is under is underlaid by the things that we are discussing right now. The principles of Bible authority and the obedience to God. And until those things are in place, we're really not going to make a lot of headway just talking about the things that we see that are different on the surface. But with that being said, since we've addressed that part, then how would these things, these, these types of obedience, how would this exemplify itself in the real world, on the practical level? How could you see that someone is being totally obedient to God in all that they do? Could you tell the difference? Well, there are a few things that we could see, a few hallmarks that should be there if somebody, especially if a group, if a church as a whole is attempting to be totally obedient to God's will. Number one, a church that is trying to be the church of the Bible that's trying to follow God's will entirely, they will, kind of like we've already said, they will follow the scriptures as their only authority. But on the practical side of that, what does that mean? Like we said, Christianity is exclusive. So what does that exclude? That excludes any kind of manual, any kind of authoritative book of prayer or catechism or any other document that's held as as important enough to say that you can be saved by the Bible and, and something else. For those who are going to be totally obedient to God's word, we are saved by the Bible. There's no and after that. And so that would exclude anything else from being added to that list. The second thing is that that church will have Christ alone as the head of the church. And so what does that exclude by definition? Well, that would have to exclude any other governing body of the church at large. The only thing that would be acceptable is what God has already shown to be the pattern in his word of how the, the New Testament church is to be structured. And we understand that, and most of you already know this. 
But we're, we're laying this out to say that there are certain features that you would expect for people that are being totally obedient. And so the third thing we would say is that they follow and they teach the whole plan that God has for saving humanity. And so that would mean that if the Bible, if we open the pages of the Bible and we see that one must be believing in order to be saved, and we say, yes, absolutely, that is true. And then when we turn to a different passage in the Bible, it says you must repent to be saved. We say, yes, that is absolutely true. And you must confess, and we say, yes, that is absolutely true. And you must be baptized for the remission of your sins, and we say, yes, that's also true. And so if we're going to be totally obedient, then we do every part of what God has commanded. Number four, a group that is striving to be totally obedient to God will worship him in the way that he says that he wants to be worshipped. Now that sounds simple enough. It really does. Let me give you an analogy, an example of this. For those of you who are married, and specifically to the men in the relationship, if your wife says that she wants this, and you go to the store, and you think, I bet instead she would like this, how is that going to go for you? Probably not too good. And why is that? Well, because people like what they like. And if we can understand that on a human level, and we can understand that you don't get somebody something that they don't want, when it comes to the worship of God, if God has said, this is what I desire, this is the, the praise that I want to, to hear from you. Then where do we get the notion that, that I can come up with something better, something different that God has not asked for? The last thing that we'll say is that a church that is trying to be as obedient as possible is going to, by necessity, try in all areas to be the church that we find in the Bible. Now, why is that? Because if I want to be totally obedient to God, then whatever God says in his word, that's what I'm doing. And whatever he shows his church doing in his word, that's what I'm going to do. Some people take this idea, of course, we would just call this restoration in general, but some people take this idea and they, they say that maybe it's some kind of arrogance to say that we could even be that church. I understand that point. I do. Some people call it traditionalism or fundamentalism to say, well, you really can't do it exactly like that, and so why even try? But here's the question. If your church, if they are, if restoring the structure that we talked about, if restoring the scriptures, if restoring the worship and restoring the salvation of the original church is not the goal of your church, then what is your church's goal? Is the goal instead to worship God in a way that we like better? Is the goal to somehow improve on the plan that God has already given for his perfect church? If the goal is not to restore the church that we find in Scripture, then what could the goal be? And what goal would be worthy? And what goal would be obedient besides that one? And so those are the, the features that we would expect to see among those who are trying to be totally obedient, which is the biblical standard for judgment. And then still we look at this, and, and probably a questioner that has brought all of this up in the first place is likely to say, well, I understand, but, but isn't there room in there for God's grace? And certainly we understand that God's grace is what saves us, that we have no hope apart from it, and so much grace is required even for those who are obedient. But is there going to be grace extended to those that know the truth and instead choose to disobey? At least in this sense, in, in the way that we're talking about with the church. And so will God cover our differences? And so long as we're sincere and so long as we have a good heart for God, will God cover that? I think the best example, there are multiple examples in the Bible of God and dealing with people without a whole lot of grace. You can look at the whole of the Old Testament. You can look at Ananias and Sapphira. But the best example, I think, comes from Apollos. In Acts chapter 18, we're induced to him in the first couple of verses. 
But Apollos, by the time we get down to verse 24, he's described there as someone that sounds a whole lot like people that we know within many groups of Christianity. So in Acts chapter 18 and in verse 24, It says, Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. And this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in spirit. He spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he only knew the baptism of John. We remember that he gets corrected after this. He goes on to be a well-known preacher, makes many converts in Corinth. And so Apollos is not wrong in and of himself. And in fact, listen to the things that are said about him. Apollos is said to be here a good speaker. There are certainly many good speakers out there that that know partial truth and teach partial truths. He also is said to be mighty in the scriptures, as in he's got a lot of Bible knowledge, which is a good thing as well. He's been trained in, in these scriptures as well. He's been instructed in the way of the Lord, meaning he's well educated says that he is fervent in spirit, so he's passionate about what he's doing and what he's saying, and he is mostly accurate. And so, with all of that, is he okay? If he's all of these good qualities, is he okay? Well, not according to the disciples of God who teach him more accurately the way that things are supposed to be. Now, would God's grace cover Apollos? I'll say that that scholars have debated this question for, for millennia, and we're not going to answer it tonight. But the question for myself would be this. Will God's grace cover Apollos? Do I want to find out? Do I want to put myself in that situation where I get most of it right, but I knowingly ignore some of the things that people have tried to teach me and correct me to be closer to what God would have us to do? And so God's grace covers a lot, but... We know that if we know that there is something better, something closer, then we have an obligation to move that direction. And God's grace is great. And God's grace saves us, but God's grace will not cover the things that we are not willing to obey. So the question, are we the only ones going to heaven? It's a good question. It really is. And it's a question that should make us think. And it's a question that requires a pretty dedicated response. But there are different ways we can answer this in a more succinct fashion. First thing that we might say, if somebody asks, are we the only ones going to heaven? Well, if your question is, are the non-denominational groups that meet under the name Churches of Christ the only ones going to heaven, then we answer, well, no, that's not the case. Because it's not about the name and it's, it's not about the, the exact traditions that maybe we hold in some areas. But at the same time, we also want to answer, no, but they better be. Otherwise, everything I'm doing is wrong. And everything I believe and everything I teach is wrong. And so, certainly, we wouldn't be here tonight unless we believe that to be the case. Second way we could answer this, though, Again, the the question, are you the only ones going to heaven? Second answer would be, well, no, but those who obey the will of God are. And unfortunately, we know because Jesus told us that there are very few who do that. Very few who are willing to obey. Another unfortunate truth alongside that is that statistically speaking, there are people in this audience tonight that go to church, that do a lot of good things, and sit lost where they are. Now, I'm not not accusing anyone in particular. I'm not seeking to condemn, but statistically speaking, it's just how that is, even within the church. Also, statistically speaking, there will be people in this room that by the end of their lifetime have fallen away from the church entirely. And so, are the churches of Christ the only ones that are going to be saved? Not everybody in them. But certainly we hope that the majority are, and we trust that that's the case or we wouldn't be part of any of this. Now, the other problem is sometimes you really can't tell until everything's over. And we see this in the parable of the tares in Matthew chapter 13, that until the harvest comes, 
You can't fully separate the, the good and the bad, and God will take care of that later on. Another way we can respond to this question, but it's probably not a way that will make us any friends, is that we could immediately respond by pointing out the misconception that the question is based on. And so there is an underlying assumption that takes place when somebody asks me or asks you the question, do you think you're the only ones going to heaven? The assumption is that I have drawn the circle. Who drew the circle of who is going to heaven and who is not? That would be God himself. Some 2,000 years ago, God drew the line. The best I can do is to recognize it when I see it. That's the best anyone can do. And so we look to the Word of God, and we study the Word of God, and we try to know the Word of God well enough to know exactly where God did place that line. But the question itself comes with the accusation that, that I have excluded somebody. When, as we've said this whole time, that Christianity, by its very nature, is exclusive. Fourth thing we could say, are we the only ones going to heaven? We could answer it by saying that it's only those who obey God's will, and it's only those that produce the fruit that we would expect somebody that is showing a, a total obedience to God to show. And so we could, we could point out to them that if someone is totally obedient to God as the Scriptures demand, that they will follow the Scriptures as their only authority, that they will have Christ as their sole head and authority in the church, that they will follow and teach the plan of, of God or of God's salvation in its fullness, that they will worship God as He has commanded in the New Testament, and that they will try to restore the church of the Bible as they see it. And so that would be another way for us to respond, but ultimately... God will determine exactly who is in this circle that he has created. And there are those that think that they're in that circle and are not, as we saw in verses 21 through 23 of Matthew chapter 7. And there are many who will be added to that circle later on. And ultimately, there may be people there or people from groups that we're surprised by. But then again, there may not be. And we don't want to put ourselves in the same position as Apollos and say, well, I'll rely on all these things, but even if I'm taught the, the way of truth, I won't necessarily change, although he did. The future of the church, strangely enough, I do believe depends on this question and the way that we answer this question. So with the future of the church, the first way that we have to answer this question is for ourselves. And so for yourself, can you answer when the question is asked, do you think that you are the only ones going to heaven? Take out the only and just ask, do you think you are going to heaven? If yes, wonderful. If yes, that's the reason that we're here. If yes, that's the reason that we have hope in the future of the church at all. If no, why not? Why don't you believe that you'll be part of that group? The second way that this applies to the future of the church is more in the short term, in the medium term, as far as the growth of the church, and as far as retaining the young people that we have in the church as well. We need to be able, each of us need to be able to give a clear and logical answer to anyone who asks this question. But in reality, this question isn't just asked by strangers. This question isn't just asked by people when the Church of Christ is brought up and this is their immediate response. This question is also asked by our children. This question is asked maybe not vocally, but the concern is there. Sometimes the doubt is there. And so how do we respond to this? When our children come to us and say, well, what do you mean my friend isn't doing things according to God's will? And what do you mean that, that God will only accept some people into heaven? And we have to make sure that our children, that the next generation that we've talked about, has a right understanding of Christianity and its exclusive nature of Christianity and who God will save based on obedience and based on His grace. And so the Lord's church, at least in some form, is dependent on the answer to this question. But this question ultimately is about the future of the church. The question is, do you think that the church is going to heaven? 
And do you think the, the church that the Lord established is the only church going to heaven? And the answer to that is yes. And so the future of the church will be dependent on this. But one other way that we could mention this, the future of the church depends on this question because the way that we're able to answer it or the way that we fail to answer it will determine if certain people are added to the church or if they're turned away forever by the way that we answer this simple question. And so we have to be ready to give a response. Again, God will ultimately be the judge of, of this question. He'll settle the matter. It won't be in our hands and may not be something we ever think about on the other side of eternity. But at least for now, we do have to deal with it in the way that we know how and, and, and to ensure that we are, of course, among those who are judged as being faithful, as being obedient, and as being covered by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Tonight, of course, if you're not in that position, then this would be the, the moment to change it. Tonight also, none of this discounts the hope that we have in Christ. Just because we recognize that Christianity is exclusive, just because we recognize that not all people will be saved, not even all those who call on Christ, still, for those that are going, for those that, that know their destination already, and for those who have yet to believe but someday will and will be added to that number, we rejoice, we have hope for this. And if anything, what this should do is encourage us, encouraging us specifically to do more, to teach more, and to let more people know, no, we're not the only ones going to heaven, but let me tell you exactly who will according to God's word. Tonight, if you have a need from the church, this is your opportunity. As I've said a couple times already this week, if you have something that you can do for the church that you haven't done in the past, the Lord's invitation is also open for that. If there's prayers that you need from the church, if you have a need to be added to the Lord's church, whatever the need is, we ask that you come forward as we stand and as we sing. We had a response tonight. Pam comes forward. Pam, I know, was here Monday night, came back again tonight, and Pam would just like us to pray for her. Um, she talked about how much she enjoyed Isaac's lessons that she got to hear this week uh, and just would really like us to pray on her behalf and uh, just pray that she uh, is on the right path, or if not, that she will find the right path to God. So uh, we would like to honor Pam's request. And uh, go to God in prayer on your behalf, Pam. Let, let us pray. Almighty God, Lord, we thank you for the time we've had uh, tonight, the time we've had this week uh, to hear lessons from your word, to explore your plan of salvation, explore the future of the church. Lord, thank you for Isaac and 
and the good words he had for us this week. Lord, we are grateful for Pam and her tender heart, uh, her desire to be here, and her desire to uh, express her need for you. And Lord, we pray that you would be with her and guide her and strengthen her. And Lord, may we as a church help her and encourage her and guide her uh, in any way that we can. Lord, we thank you that uh, she responded tonight. And Lord, please just be with her uh, each day and help her to seek your word, seek your truth, and be right with you. Lord, we are grateful again for the time we've had this week. We pray for Isaac and his ministry as he continues on. Bless him, bless Olivia and, and their family. And Lord, we just all want to go to heaven. We all want to be together eternally with you. And we pray that we would be obedient to you and to your word, and that that would be the outcome of our lives, to spend eternity in heaven with you. Lord, we thank you uh, for Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's pray a final time this evening. Please bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, we, we are so grateful for this time that we could be together this evening and yesterday evening and Monday and, mm -hmm. and on Sunday. Father, we thank you for this series of lessons that we've heard and we thank you for Isaac and his study and his preparation. Father, most of all, his, his desire to spend his life uh, preaching your word and, and teaching others and, and, and you through him uh, saving souls. Father, as uh, Buddy just prayed a moment ago, we ask you to continue to be with Isaac and Olivia and their family and, and just bless them and watch over them um, and uh, help them, Father, to be successful in their desire to serve you. But Father, we thank you that, that we have here tonight such a desire to go to heaven and, and to study your word. And we pray that that we will be serious about that and, and we will give ourselves to that truly. Father, we're thankful for the hope of heaven that we have in front of us and help us to realize as we talked about tonight in the lesson, Father, the, the, that, that heaven is the, is the place that we all should desire to go and, and we should make every effort that we can to, to come under your banner of grace and, and to be saved from our sins. Help us to realize, of course, that heaven is not ours to give. It is yours to give, and, and, and we want that. We want that gift uh, to be given to us. Father, we thank you for Jesus who makes that all possible. His coming to this earth and him, him, him teaching the lessons that he taught and, and, and doing the miracles that he did, and then his death and, and resurrection. Father, we thank you for, for the pattern that he set for us. And we pray that we will get up every day with the desire to be like Jesus and, and to walk in his steps. Father, thank you for Pam and thank you for her response tonight. We pray that your blessings will be upon her life and that you would lead her closer, ever closer uh, to you. Lead us all closer to you. Be with us now as we go to our, our places of, of rest and, and time to be with our family and friends. And we pray that, that, uh, that you would bless us safely, Father, as we leave this place. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.